Hi, everyone, and welcome to the special simulcast of The Neil Haley Show, and, uh, and I'm also the sports category director for Podcast Magazine, and I'm interviewing somebody who, again, was an arch rival as a fan, growing up as a Steeler fan, Eric Metcalf, three-time Pro Bowler, Cleveland Brown, and much, much more. Eric, thanks for stopping by. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Sure. All right. So let's talk. Let's talk. And as I, I love your setup with all your, your uh, on the wall of fame of all the things you did. Did you imagine when you started that you were going to be, do you always want to be a football star? Was that something growing up you wanted? 100%. Okay. And, it, and it's because of this picture right here. Okay. My dad. My dad. Oh, oh yeah, I remember that. Okay, all right. Because Terry Metcalf, I, I wanted to be a football player because that's what my dad was doing. And so, you know, a lot of times we grew up as kids, everybody wants to do what their dad is doing. You know, whether it be a fireman, a, a police officer, what have you. My dad was a football player, and so that's who I wanted to be. And that's so that's so right off the bat. So how young were you when you started to to want to wanna throw the football with your dad and really be into this? How young? Well, well, you know, the thing about it is my mother and father, they had me in high school. And so when my dad really got to playing, he was in college and I was young enough where I could go to the games, but you know, so he wasn't around at that time as far as me playing catch with him. But I started playing football at, at seven years old. And and I remember my mother telling me she was going to take me down there to sign up for, for football. And um, she said, but she kept saying, when you get there, you have to tell him you're eight. Because <laughs> it started, because it started, at, it was eight and nine, 89 ers. And I was only seven. She's like, you got to tell him you're eight. And so I went down and I was like, I'm eight years old. And, then, and a lot of my friends were going also, and they weren't eight either, but we were all saying we were eight years old. And so that's when I, I really fell in love with it just because that was that first opportunity to get out there and play in pads. So starting out at the beginning, now, did you have uh, like uh, a little weight on your shoulders because your father was such a good football player? You know, as a, as a kid, I never really thought about it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, other people did because I would always hear uh, older guys and, and, and people talk about they can't wait to see me play if, if I ever play and everything. And I remember hearing people talk about that, but I never even really thought about the, the weight or the pressure of, of being Terry Metcalf's son until I got older. But, and then when I finally got older, the only time I, I, I didn't really think about it because I, I was good at it. I mean, if, if you're you're not really good at it. I think you feel that weight or that pressure. But I, I knew early on in, in when I was playing that I, that I was pretty good at it. So you knew you were pretty good at it. Now, were you the one of the best players on your team all the time? Because people think about, you know, a professional athlete, they have to, that's the thing. Everyone says, hey, I want to be a pro football star. I want to be a pro basketball star. You have to be the very best of most of the time than everybody. Was it always you were the best or was it a process to get better and better? To, I, I, to, to be honest, I think I was the best football player on my team until maybe somebody would say somebody in Cleveland. But but from Little League on through high school, through college, I was the best player on my team always. And and, and I, I, that's no doubt in my mind. And, and, and that's, not, that's not a slight against everyone else. It's no. just the reality of it. And so, and, and then... If we talk about Cleveland, I probably think I was the best player there, but it's all debatable on what you like and, and, and who likes me and who likes other players. Exactly. So let's go. How much of it was talent and how much was it, was preparation? Well, at a, at a young age, a lot of it was just talent. It was it was genetics, God given ability um, at seven, eight years old. I was probably faster than kids nine and 10, 11, 12. And so, so I always ran track in an in a, uh, older age group because it wasn't, my coaches just had me run with older guys like on relays and everything because I could help their team better than someone else could. So, so at, at a young age, it was, it was more, so, like I said, talent and, and genetics. And so I knew then that if given the opportunity, um, I, I would be able to be successful at it. The only thing I worried about at that age was, I was really short. <laughs> I, I was I was I was really short, and and, and people, and I you know, and, and I, I think people's like, oh, he's too small to go out there and play football. 
um, it's, it's not going to work. And I'll never forget my dad used to tell me, don't let anyone tell you you're too small because that's the same thing they used to tell me. He Were said, you guys the same, close to the same height, you and your dad? Um, as, as players, yes. When we got the NFL and yeah, we were about the same. So he was maybe an inch taller. I was maybe a little heavier, but yeah, he used to tell me that. And so I, I never really worried about it. I just, I just went out there and played and, and, and tried to do the best that I could. When you think about size and small, small backs and, you know, what do you think makes the small backs so elusive and such a, I mean, if you think of the greatest small backs, I think one of them would definitely be Barry Sanders. And then you think of other, it goes on and on and on different people. Uh, well, why is it everyone thinks they need to have the prototypical running back when what you could do with so many different things and make you so versatile? I think it's uh, 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 cycle, cycles in football. I mean, because, you know, when my dad and those guys were playing, they used a lot of smaller guys. My dad, Greg Pruitt, guys like that who could do a lot of things, you know, catch the ball, run the ball, and, and return kicks. And then, then the cycle changed, and, and they were using these uh, big old guys who were playing ground and, and pound football. And, that, and, and now it's gotten back to uh, a game where, because it's so spread out, that guys my size can can prosper because you have the Christian McCaffrey's, you have you have the Dalvin Cooks, you have Alvin Kamara's, and those guys who can do everything. So they're more valuable to a team. So it, it, it's all about the, how the game is being played. And, and right now, I, I wish I was playing in this game because when I was playing, it wasn't played like there was more big backs. But guys like myself, Barry Sanders, we had to try to figure it out, and, and Barry did as well for sure. Oh, absolutely. And they, and they figure it out because everyone would say, oh, I want the big back. But then you find out what you can do as the prototypical running back. So let's jump. I'm jumping back into the whole thing. Now, were you highly – so you said you were the best player in high school. How much were you recruited to go play college? Because, again, you're a smaller back. Even though you're doing so well in high school and you're the best player on your team, were you highly recruited in, out of high school? I was recruited by almost everyone. I mean, I got, I had so many letters from schools that I, I just got sick of it, but I wasn't ready to make a decision. So I, I actually took my five visits. I went to uh, Notre Dame. I went to Nebraska. I went to Georgia, Texas, and Miami. And so, and all of, there was so many other schools that I could have gone and visit. I just wanted, I didn't want to. And, and so, because in my mind, other than going to, uh, Miami at the time, I, I was thinking track also, you know, I was, and so I had to, that's what I was thinking about it. So I was recruited by, heavily recruited by everyone. I think size did play a factor into a, when a, a story I heard later on after I was at Texas. So like once uh, I, I was being recruited by Texas, uh, they asked me to send my film. And, and they told me that the, the, all the coaches were in there watching my film. And Fred Akers was our head coach, asked the, the staff, what do they think? And they, he said, they told me it was unanimous that everyone was like, no, he can't do this in, in, in the Southwest Conference because I played in a, in a private school league. And so oh, they thought the things that I was doing, I couldn't do that uh, on, a, on a bigger scale. And, and, and then... Coach Akers told them, well, I think he can, and the rest is history. I guess I could. So right off your freshman year, were you playing a lot, or did it take time to get to that? No, I, I played a lot as a freshman. I didn't start, but I played a lot. I played every every game. I mean, you know, when you've been carrying the ball and catching the ball in your entire life, you always wanted more. So I, I feel like as a, as a freshman, I could have had it more, but, you know, it, it worked out the way it did, and, I, and I'm fine with it. Exactly. It's, it is what it's, what it is happens and everything. And when you were here at, at Texas, how good were you guys when you were at Texas? Well, <laughs> we won in, in my, in my four years, I think we won 24 games. Okay. And, and so my, my freshman year, we won eight and we were ranked. Uh, and my junior year, we won seven Okay, seven, seven or eight, and we were ranked. But other than that, we, we weren't very good. And, and I, I'll never forget, I'm glad you asked that, because I, I, I got to Texas, and we, we 
of course we're not going through pads and all that, but once we really start playing in, in, in practice as freshmen, I'm, I, I go to my college roommate and I was like, you know, either I'm real good or Texas football isn't what they make it out to be. And, and he looked at me and he just says, why can't it be both? <laughs> and I was like, you got a point there. So, but I was like, I, I, I guess I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out for me. Wow. I mean, and so playing in Texas, was that a, did you love the campus and stuff, especially the Saturdays in Texas? Oh, I loved it. I, I, and I still love it. I mean, the only thing I regret about the whole time being there is that we didn't win enough games. I didn't, I was, I didn't beat Oklahoma. I lost to them four straight years. I didn't beat Texas A&M. I lost to them four straight years. The two teams were supposed to beat, right? And so that, that's the only thing I regret is that we, our team as a whole, we weren't good enough to win those games. We were, we had, we gave ourselves a fighting chance, but we weren't, the team that like everyone feared on, on Saturday afternoons. And so if, if I could change anything, it would be that. that. And that's it, that we won more football games because I had a blast of a time when I was there and 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 and, and it was good football. It, it, we, we just didn't win games. And I, you know, I was even as a freshman, I was like, I didn't get the ball as much as I wanted, but it was still good football. It was fun and I know it's gonna get better. And, and cause even uh, Mike Lombardi, came to me as a freshman and he was at our pro day and I didn't do anything cause I was doing track mm -hmm. at the time. And he was at, he was at the 49ers then. And he comes to me, he says, I'm, I'm going to draft you when you, when you're a senior. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> He's like, I, I am, I, I promise I'm going to draft you. And, and bam, look what happens. He, he's at the Browns and, and I get drafted. <laughs> so what were you, uh, uh, like wanted really well in the NFL, like you were in college, or did they think the small back, well, we're going to take a chance on you type of thing, the Browns, or was it, they knew it was a really good draft pick to draft you? You know, I, I think that guys knew that I, I was a good football player. I and mean, you know what? It's not about, I think it was the, it was more so the fact that I could do a lot of things and I could play running back if I had to. They see me split out as a receiver uh, and the Texas offense, return kicks and punts. And so when you, you get someone who can do all those things, I think regardless of size, people take chances on them. And, 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 and I don't say it's a chance on me because I went in the first round, but they, they figured I could do these things in the NFL and be successful with it. And I think that's why the Browns, uh, I know that's why the Browns uh, traded all those picks and moved up and, and got me. All right. So a lot of times now we're again talking to Eric Metcalf. And I think that in a lot of ways after your career in the NFL, people were like, where's Eric Metcalf now? Now he has a podcast. We're going to get to that soon. But going to the Cleveland Browns, uh, how amazing the time you are you had with the Browns, because think about it, you were winning. You were very close many times, just didn't get to the Super Bowl. It, it was amazing, and, and which is. 180 from what I thought it was going to be. Cause you know, when I got to Cleveland, when I've got drafted by the Browns, you know, you're happy to be drafted. You, you, everybody wants the ultimate dream and goal to be drafted and be playing in NFL. And so I'm just definitely happy with that. I never really thought of myself playing for the Cleveland Browns though, when I was, when I was coming out and, and, and working towards the draft in my mind, I wanted to be in, LA with the Rams. Mm -hmm. I had friends and I, I thought I was, I thought I was Hollywood kind of guy <laughs> and I should, you know, I should be in, in, in LA. And, but, and, and then I got drafted by the Browns. I go to mini camp in, in May and it's snowing. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm like, Oh, this isn't going to work. Cause this is May. What's going to happen when it's November, December, it's going to be really snowing and they're playing on Natural dirt, not natural grass at that stadium. No, that's <laughs> natural, natural dirt, dirt. yeah. <laughs> that was natural dirt. And so I was like, how am I going to be able to play the way I play in, in, in Cleveland? And so, you know, and didn't really think about it. I held out my freshman, I mean, my, my rookie year because of contract. Um, finally get there, started practicing and, and, and playing. 
and everything was smooth sailing. I had a world of a time. The guys took me in like I had been there forever and we were winning games and, and I was getting to do the things that I wanted to do. So it was great the entire time I was there. I wish I, wish I could say I played my entire career with the Cleveland Browns, but even had I not got traded in 1995, I still wouldn't have been a Brown my entire career because the team left. Exactly, the team left. And so that could go to the stories of being part of that. But you were part of two, I guess, of the hardest times of your life, right? Against the Broncos, right? Two years, you were both years, right? No, I was only I was only there once in '89. So I, yeah, I missed the I missed the drive and the fumble, and then they just beat us. My in '89, they beat us uh, out there in Denver in the AFC Championship. Oh, so you were a year before. So were you? You weren't there those two years. So your fresh your rookie year was in '89. Yes. Okay. So you were the, the the supposed to be the thing that was going to change everything, right? You're the guy that that final missing component of the Browns. And so you had a cast of characters on that team, right? For sure. Tell us, remind us some of the players again. We had Webster Slaughter, Reggie Langhorn, Kevin Mack, Ozzie Newsom, Eddie Johnson, Clay Matthews, Felix Wright, Hanford Dixon, uh, Frank Minifield, uh, Tony Jones, Mike Babb, Brian Brennan. Yeah. And we had a we had a slew of guys. We we had a very good team. We we had a good team of uh, player wise. We had we had good coach, and we just you know it just didn't just didn't work out for us. I mean, and that, it was funny that year we thought we were going to the Super Bowl. We, we, Reggie Langhorn, I, myself, and Webster Slaughter, we used to always talk about who was going to be Super Bowl MVP once we got into the playoffs because we were going to play Denver in the um, AFC Championship. We had already beaten them during the season. We're like we're gonna we're gonna go beat these guys and we're, we're gonna be in the Super Bowl. And unfortunately, they had they they didn't listen to us and and, and they won games and and it never happened. So was that was three years in a row that you guys lost to the Broncos? No, I think no no they they lost two in a row and then they they didn't make it to the championship the next year and then when I came we went back. Uh, okay. People always remember the drive and fumble and forget that year. Right. And so, you know, and so what's crazy about it is when you play in the NFL and you get that close, especially in your rookie year, you think there's no way I'm not ever going to make it to the Super Bowl. But no season's the same. And there is a way I'm never going to make it to the Super Bowl because it never happens. <laughs> Maybe now it would have been a lot easier in the way they give opportunities for teams to based on these balance, the schedule always giving teams that win a lot to have a more difficult schedule. That wasn't like that then. The no, way that I mean, I think, I mean, even the year I, before I got traded in 1994, we were 11 and five and we, and we didn't even win the division because the Steelers did. Um, 11 and five, 12 and six, if you count the playoffs and three of our losses were to the Steelers. And so, and so that's it, it was just it was just a tough road, and you know people take people take for granted, especially like if you've been playing in New England the past few years, you take it for granted that you can get to the Super Bowl. When you when you have people like me and and, and other guys who who never got to the Super Bowl and, and just had hoped to get there, and I you know because my whole career I was like I could just run out of that tunnel one time on Super Bowl. I worry about winning it later. I just want to be able to run out of the tunnel as a player. That was that used to be my thing. Wow. And, but it never happened. Never happened. But you did have some pretty amazing things. Now, uh, talking about you were part of, I didn't know that you're, so you're part of the move then, right? From the Browns? No, no, I'm technically I'm not because um, they, they played their last season in 95. They traded me in the spring of 95 to Atlanta. So they went, so they played that last season. I was already in Atlanta. So do you know, but you knew it was going to happen before that, right? I, I, I had been told, I had heard little rumblings of it. And, and so not only did they, they, they trade me and they, they weren't winning games, but I got, I felt good because I got to go to Atlanta and we went to the playoffs. And, and, you know, and so we, I had, I had fun that year. I got the ball. I got the ball a lot. I caught 104 passes. I ran the ball. I returned some kicks. I returned some punts. And so I had I had fun doing what I thought that I would do my entire career in Cleveland. Oh wow! So getting traded. So you had rumblings of this before the trade. Then once you were traded, you're like, thank goodness I wasn't part of that whole get up and leave because everyone, you know, you're you're a beloved Brown 
if you would have went and, and been part of that move, who knows, right? And at least in a way you can stay a Brown forever in a way, because those other guys, they got, they had to be part of it and part of that Raven process and how, you know, Cleveland people still are upset about, right? Yeah, yeah, but you know, I think with in cases like myself, I think no matter what, because even still today, people in Cleveland treat me as if the Browns are the only team I play for. And that's how I actually feel sometimes. I mean, that's because I, I love the Browns and love being a part of that tradition for, for so long that I, I feel like I, I did enough things and, and, and play, uh, played well enough there that people want me to be associated with that franchise when we're talking about people from Ohio and Cleveland Browns fans. So I feel good about it, regardless of whether I was traded, even though I asked to be traded or not. I just feel good that I wanted to, that I did a, enough good things for a story franchise that, that people associate me with them. Did you play, so you played for the Falcons and that, who were you, who did you play with after the Falcons? I thought you played a couple other teams. So, so I, the Browns traded me to the Falcons. I played there two years. I left to San Diego as a free agent. They traded me to the Cardinals. And so then I played one year. I went to Carolina and played with the, the, the Redskins. So I guess it was a theme of me getting traded. I got traded to a bird each time. <laughs> and that's where you became more and more special teams, right? Then, right? Yeah, because it, it was towards the end of my career. And, and, and at that time, you know, no one was going to use me like I wanted to be used. So it, it was kind of tough. I mean, all these so-called offensive geniuses couldn't figure it out, right? And, and, and were scared to, to be innovative as they are today. When, when we're talking about June, June Jones and, and Miles Davis and those guys and, and everybody in, in, in at the Oilers, when they were using the run and shoot, people like, this can't work. People, this, this can't work in the NFL. This will never be successful. Now everybody's running a form of that, right? And, yeah. so, and that's what's successful. And that's how people are getting all these points and all these yards. And so people back then were just scared to do it. Now you have guys who are just playing, putting their best players on the field and trying to win games. Because if you have, if you have four or five people like myself who play running back receiver and all that, and you spread everybody all over the place, what can a defense really do? And, then, and, that's, and that's what these guys have, have, have picked up on in, in these later years. All right, so let's go from, we talked about life after football. Did you have a decision? Did you know what you were gonna do after football, your football career was over? Nah, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I do know that because of my, my track break background that I, I wanted to be involved with track. So, mm -hmm. so prior to uh, actually retiring, I had, I had started a, a, a track club here in Seattle okay. for high school kids. And, and so during the summer, I would train these guys and I'd had other coaches, obviously. So when I went to training camp, they would take them to the national meets and all that. But I was really involved with that because I was trying to give these young guys, because it was all high school guys when I first started, uh, I was trying to give these guys the opportunity to get to, to college on someone else's dime, right? Because everyone can't be a football player, everyone can't be a basketball player, but you can go run track anywhere and you can get some money from uh, schools from all divisions and, and make it easier on yourself. And so that's what I was trying to do and, and I established that and then I, um, later on brought girls on and I was really coaching us. Then I started coaching high school track. Okay. And I coached football, high school football with my dad and at another high school for a couple of years, but it's not really my thing. I don't, I don't really like it because <laughs> to, to be good at, you got to really work at it. You got to put in a lot of time, but, but track, I, I was able to be more one-on-one -on -one with these kids. And so I, we were doing well. My team won state championships. I had a lot of guys and girls who, uh, made like U.S. national teams, oh, wow. uh, did a lot of people who won national championships at Junior Olympics and everything like that. And so then that evolved to me uh, coaching track at the University of Washington. Wow. Okay. So yeah. coaching and track. So, yes. so were you happy you chose that over coaching football? If you're a good coach? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because my thing has always been like when you, when you're coaching football, I could coach say Randy Moss. Right. But if we don't have a quarterback or a line, you'll never know that I'm coaching the best receiver in the league. You, you never know. Yeah, that's right. But whereas 
when we're talking about coaching track, no matter what event, the kid doesn't have to win, doesn't even have to make the finals. But you know, when you coach that kid, if they're improving, whether it be height, distance, or time, they, they, are, they, can, they can win every, every meet or event they're in without ever winning because they're getting better every single time. And so that, and that's what I like about that as far as the, the, the individuality of it is that we can tell how kids or, or athletes are getting better regardless of what happens in the other lanes. Absolutely. Okay. So you, how long did you coach for? Are you still coaching track or? So I, I, I coached, I coached track at UW from, I want to say 2012 to like 2018. Um, and at this time, for most of the time, I still had my track club. I kind of just let that go away because it takes a lot of time. But now I do um, consulting with Nike track and field um, and, and, and a lot of high, and high school kids and everything like that. And so that's, that, that's what I'm doing now. So I'm, I'm still involved with it in, in track, but not, not so much coaching it anymore. Got it. Got it. All right. Let's talk about the podcast. Did you ever think you were going to do a podcast? Was that something when someone approached you to do a podcast? How did that happen? You know, it's kind of weird because prior to COVID and all that kind of stuff, I was thinking I should do a podcast, but but I didn't know what I really wanted to do it about, you know, because I, I didn't know, because I'm into smoking cigars, so I, in my mind, I wanted to be smoking cigars and, and, and talking sports or whatever. That's that was my mind. But the thing is, how was I going to be able to get this done, you know? Cause I would want people to be there smoking, but in order to do that, you gotta have, be around these guests. Exactly. I didn't know, ever know how that was gonna be done. And then, you know, when, when, when the Believe Network uh, contacted me and they said, we can, you can do this about the Browns, I'm like, okay, I could do that. Cause, cause I, I you know, I, I do some, I do a pre-game and post-game show in Cleveland on channel 19 WIOIO there. And so that's fun, but I, I don't, you, you, you can't really say what you want to say. So yeah, on the podcast, you can say more. Yeah, you're, you're right. trying to be politically correct in a way and not rip the coaches right. or right. say certain things because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a coach, it's a Homer show, right? Compared to when you're doing a podcast where you can really break things down with yeah, and, and You know, and, and a lot of people, a lot of times people don't like it, but it's okay because it's my opinion. And when it's your opinion, you don't really have to, you don't have to really apologize because that's your opinion. Everyone has their opinion, right? And so I, I think when I, when, I, when I talk Brown stuff and, and, and a lot of people get mad at, at some things that I said, but when I, when I tell them, the things I'm saying are from my experience as a player, <laughs> as a player, that changes your opinion and your experience as it because my experience as a player as to what happened or what I think should have happened is different than yours. And so I, I like having that perspective because uh, I'll use Odell Beckham, for example, okay. when he was with the Browns. People were talking about he was he was mad, he was he was hurting the team because he wanted the ball and all. he wasn't getting the ball, blah, 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 when you should be about winning. And I said, this is, I understand this, but when we were 11 and five in 1994, I asked for a trade because I, I was not getting the ball like I wanted to. And so as a player, you, you, you like to win, but in the end, it's, it's about being an individual yeah. and being successful as an individual because that's what's going to get you paid. That's what's going to get you noticed and things like that. So that's, so I understand how he felt and they were losing. And he's not getting the ball. So that makes it even worse. <laughs> right? right. And so, and so these are the kind of things that I'm able to try to get across to, to these people, uh, to people on, on fans on, on the podcast. And by the podcast, that may, gives you a lot more, uh, I guess, accessibility to your fan, to the fans with a podcast, because now they're reaching out to Eric Metcalf versus reaching out to W to the station 19 or different places. So what you're saying, you're making that connection with your fans that are listening and seeing what they want to hear and what they want to talk about compared to if you're like on another station with certain types of sponsors, it's on the radio where you really can't do the way it's your podcast. You can do a little bit more. You can 
really break things down more. And you can hear the feedback from the fans in a little different way than if you're doing a drive time show, right? Right, yeah, because you know, you sit there and you can say, okay, I want to talk about Kevin Stefanski today. And this, and I can just go on about that where, you know, you talk- Because you're not working for callers, so right. you can- <laughs> Right, so when you're on TV and everything, it's about blocks and we're going to talk about this in this segment. And suddenly so it's like, no, I'm going to talk about the defense today <laughs> or the offense and what have you and why we're not doing whatever. That, and, I, and I love having that ability to just do and say what I want and talk about the things that I want to get off my chest with, with, with my host as well. How much uh, time do you put into the podcast weekly to prepare? You know, it, it, it all depends. Like, move, working up to the draft, I try to figure out. I'm, it's, and it's hard because no one ever knows who we're going to draft. We know what we need, but who we're going to draft. My, my thing right now is I, I feel like we got to get Jadavion Clowney, so I'm trying to get him back. So I'm keeping an eye on that kind of thing. So, so I'm always – in in in, uh, in the news in Cleveland, trying to search things, trying to see what people are talking about, especially especially because I'm here in Seattle, so I'm not getting all that same news. So it makes it a little harder. So, but I'm always trying to poke around and see if I can find some stuff. Just so when it is time to uh, have have a show that I can I can talk about and be up on it. That's great. That's that's uh, definitely. Uh, what how much? What about social media? How's that changing? Especially having a podcast. Have you put more time and emphasis into your social media? You know, I, 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 not as much. I, I probably should. I only have Twitter. I don't mess around with yeah. Instagram and all that. But I, and Twitter I, is the best for sports, so stick to what you know. Yeah, but my thing is, I, I when I get on there, there are so many times that there are things that I want to say to people, and I'm like, I can't say that. And so it's not fair. And so, and so, and so I won't say things because if, if you know me, I'm one of those guys who will snap back real quick and I can say real stuff that'll like get you <laughs> but I I always I see my find myself uh, typing things and erasing it <laughs> because I'm like nah, I can't do that I can't get into it with this person and then because then I look like the bad guy <laughs> and uh do you because you're in Seattle do you travel to Cleveland sometimes for the games I travel to every home game Every home game, okay. I do every home. Actually, I have to do the, the TV show every home game. Okay. I, I do uh, in studio away games. I get to do it from Zoom, and everyone else is in the studio. Okay, so you're doing that while also the podcast. But so the podcast is not as much of the coverage as your full time job, or not full time, but one of your TV gigs. So you get you go the home games. So you're the face of the Browns in certain ways and all that stuff. That so that kind of changed. And I'm interested for another story or another time, I guess, to do, delve into how you went from track, coaching track, then to back into the analyst position. Do you want to go to any of the bigger ones for to be an analyst? Do you want to end up on the NFL Today at one point or, or ESPN or all that? People have asked me that. And, and I think if given the opportunity, I would I would definitely do it because it's that's when it's getting bigger. You're getting at a higher level. However, I do like being able to go back to Cleveland every week and, and talk Browns. I like being in that environment because it's different than being there when you play. You know, I, I feel like I have more fun. I'm able to just interact with people more doing now that I'm retired and, and doing this. And so I get to find out what people are really thinking when we're talking about the coaching or the or the players or what the Browns should do, and it's and it, and it's more fun. I, I I have fun doing that, and so I like being uh, in Cleveland and doing things there. But I, obviously, if I was given the opportunity to go bigger, I, I would probably do it. All right. So where can you go ahead and check out your podcast? Is available at the Believe Podcast, and what's the name of it again? The Dog Check the Believe Podcast Network. All right. Awesome. And again, check you out on Twitter at and make sure he won't respond negatively, right? <laughs> just just don't changing. start a fight with me. Just don't start a fight. We'll be all right. <laughs> is, is, it, is it just at Eric Metcalf? Eric, at Eric Metcalf 21. All right. Well, fantastic, Eric. We appreciate you coming by, talk about this, and be part of the podcast magazine. And I won't hold it against you. You're a Cleveland Brown. I think you dealt with the same thing as the Steelers and Browns were trying to grow together to get to that pinnacle. And then, after, and then the 90s hit, and then – the Steelers became 
more of the Steelers while the Browns became no longer. <laughs> so now I'm the Steelers. That's okay because I, I, that's okay I can say I beat them. There you I go. Them. I took two punt returns against them and to, and got coaches fired. I can say that. So I, all that other stuff that you're talking about, ah, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> and then and the Browns roller coaster continues, right? And that's what you're excited about because you have something to talk about every week. Hey, we're, we're coming back. We're gonna we're coming back. We'll be okay. all right. We'll, we'll see. All right. We'll watch. Okay. Go, all right. Go. All right. See you. Okay. Right. Good talking, Eric. Take care. All right. Take care, guys.